That was a real nice introduction that I wrote myself. <laughs> so who is uh, this organization that I uh, am representing today? It's a newly formed Montanans for Affordable Electricity. It's a newly formed uh, nonprofit corporation. Uh, we established it in July uh, of this year. Uh, in, in anticipation mostly of the enactment of the final rules of the Clean Power Plan. But what it does, this Clean Power Plan, is to bring together the issues and the concerns and the uh, future uh, that we've been working toward for the last 40 years or so. There are three of us in this little organization. Uh, I'm pleased to work with Kathy Hadley. Many of you know her as the executive director of the uh, of NCAT. Uh, she has an extensive background and long involvement in uh, issues related to energy conservation, uh, efficiency. She was a former uh, Energy Bureau Chief at DNRC when DNRC encompassed uh, even the responsibilities of DEQ. Uh, she's been active in the region uh, as well with the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. So lots of background uh, with Kathy and I respect her very highly. Jim Morton, as some of you may know, uh, is the Executive Director of the Human Resource Council District 11 out of the Missoula, Mineral County, and uh, uh, Valley County. Jim has been involved as the Executive Director of uh, HRC in Missoula for uh, since the late 70s. And he has also been responsible for hiring uh, Dr. Thomas Michael Power, Tom Power, uh, as the expert witness for the low income and residential community, uh, probably the key uh, expert witness in public service commission cases uh, for the last three or four decades. So Jim is intimately familiar with the issues we're involved uh, with the uh, Clean Power Plan. Again, our careers have focused specifically on affordability of rates, uh, low income families, uh, renewables, energy efficiency, reliability, and stewardship. So again, this clean power plan, as uh, proposed in the new regs, uh, brings together issues we've uh, felt passionately about and dealt with for uh, a heck of a long time. We hope to apply and offer uh, the experiences that we've had uh, the expertise that we've developed over that period of time uh, in whatever stakeholder processes uh, are developed and used in Montana. And Tom Livers talked uh, some about that process yesterday and the importance of that process. I am a big believer in stakeholder involvement and, and collaboration and obtaining buy-in and through that direct involvement in terms of creating the most attractive outcome. And the most attractive outcome, uh, in our view, uh, is, a, is attractive for Montana, our economy, our families, our job situation. Juggling a little few too many things, and I'm not very multi-talented here, so I'm, I'm going to advance slides uh, manually here. At long last, the U.S. has uh, finally adopted a strategy uh, to address climate change. It's been a long time coming. Uh, we've dragged our feet in the international community for a long time. and. Uh, at long last, we're uh, taking an important step, a leadership step. The Clean Power Plan establishes a schedule of CO2 emission reductions uh, over a phase-in period. And if you look at that phase-in period, I mean, it doesn't really start in terms of requirements until 2022. We've got a seven-year window to develop and begin 
this important transition. Provides Montana with significant responsibility as well as flexibility for developing a unique Montana plan. And Tom Livers, again yesterday, uh, highlighted uh, DEQ's responsibility and uh, direct authority there. In our view, Montana must capitalize on this new challenge and convert it into what I think it is, and that is an opportunity for Montana to facilitate affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy future for ourselves and future generations. We need to meet those CO2 reduction goals keep our eye on affordability and reliability, make sure the plan uh, is based solidly on a transition to renewables, energy efficiency, uh, sustainability. The opportunity to switch gears and uh, transition away from a reliance on our coal-centric uh, power supply provides us an opportunity to promote widespread economic benefits. The wind is not constrained to the Potter River Basin coal fields, it's widely available. And the slides you've seen over the last, particularly this morning, uh, demonstrate the, uh, the resource pattern and availability throughout Montana. It's been well documented by the National Re Renewable Energy Lab in uh, Boulder. It's used throughout WEC. Uh, the resource is well characterized both in terms of wind and solar. We need to optimize and repurpose the existing high voltage transmission in Montana as a part of this transition. And I'll be talking more about that uh, uh, as we uh, proceed here. And then we need to be sensitive and adopt a transition plan that is uh, sensitive to and mitigates the direct impacts on the affected coal communities. Uh, the workers, the communities that have come to rely on those resources and uh, hope to advance some ideas on that. So we've adopted a series of principles that you won't be able to read. It's a little wordy, but it captures a number of those same uh, uh, ideas that I just advanced. So what does it mean in terms of the, the required reductions? Again, yesterday, Tom Livers talked in general terms about the change from the uh, the initial draft order, draft regulations, to the final regulations. This is a, a slide, again, that originates with DEQ and uh, establishes the different uh, levels and goals under the final plan. In round terms, Montana needs to, the Montana plan needs to uh, reduce the level of uh, CO2 emissions by about six and a half million tons uh, uh, by the end of the transition period. And that's going to be a challenge. Some have said Montana and coal states have been, uh, some other coal states have been unfairly uh, singled out for uh, dramatic reductions. <coughs> It does reflect a big change from the uh, initial draft. It did provide some, some people have called it sticker shock, some political shock, some uh, surprise uh, to the agencies and everybody in this room probably about the level of change. Does the level of change make sense? Do the goals make sense? I think that's the key, the key issue. So as you look at the slide sloping from left to right and downward, you see you see the band of requirements on the initial uh, draft of the rule. 
up in the 2000 range uh, in terms of pounds per megawatt hour, ranging down into the twos, 200s. That was the range for the various states under the initial plan. The final plan treats all coal plants and all natural gas combined cycle plants in the same manner. That is, there are limits established for each of those fossil fuel resources based on their uh, relative uh, CO2 output. Here is Montana, here is North Dakota, here's Wyoming, right up in this range. And why are we there in terms of the emission rates? Because we have exclusively coal-fired generation that is serving uh, or that is located in Montana that's subject to the CPP. On the other end of the scale are states where uh, there is no coal located uh, and the proxy there is uh, combined cycle gas at 771. So the range is tighter to me, much more defensible in terms of the rationale for the uh, pollution control limits, emission limits. Uh, I don't think Montana has been unfairly singled out. Uh, I think we've been treated even handedly. But it is this dramatic change from the interim that I think is causing uh, a lot of gnashing of teeth. And that's not to say it's not gonna be difficult to get there. Uh, but let's keep our eye on the ball of the end result. This is the breakdown of the coal emissions by plant in Montana. And even though one of these facilities, the Yellowstone uh, facility is uh, petroleum coke, it's treated in the same way as coal. So all of these are coal units effectively uh, in terms of the requirements. And these are the adjusted uh, 2012 levels. Again, this comes from uh, DOQ, DEQ uh, handout at the uh, legislative uh, joint committee interim meeting a couple of weeks ago. So you can see from a mathematical point of view, if you've got to go from the 19 range to the 11 and a half range, that's six and a half I was talking about, uh, you've got to make some important choices, either through market mechanisms and trading, uh, or direct reduction and retirement of uh, coal plants in order to meet those targets. A little background might be helpful, uh, particularly for those of you who may not have been from Montana, but hopefully it's a refresher uh, for all of us. Montana's legacy in coal is a lot like our legacy in uh, hard rock metals and, and uh, timber industry, other resource industries in Montana. In the energy arena, it has been particularly controversial. In the early to mid 70s, well, in the late 60s, uh, the coal strip one and two were proposed and actually came into service uh, in uh, 1974 and five. Those plants were owned jointly by Montana Power Company at the time and Puget Sound Energy in uh, the Seattle, uh, western uh, Washington area. Those 50-50 plants did not require uh, the same level of trans transmission that the next slate did. So one and two come on in the middle 70s, 40 years ago. Three and four were proposed, coal strip three and four were proposed uh, at that same time in the middle 70s, went through the Montana Major Facility Siting Act, 
That was a statewide environmental assessment uh, and social assessment of those, that project, the generating plants through the, the major twin 500 kV uh, transmission lines. Very controversial. It was what I've called a bloodbath for a long time. Issues related to coal strip uh, still resonate in, in Montana by uh, people that lived through it. So in the late 80s, uh, Montana Power, again at the time, established a collaborative. And that collaborative involved uh, trying to assure that we, little choked up here, that we never go through that uh, kind of a bloodbath again to do things a better way. The collaborative involved the power company, it involved DEQ, uh, Montana Consumer Council, it involved the Human Resource Council out of Missoula with Tom Power as their expert witness, it involved Northern Plains Resource Council that I uh, was uh, happy to uh, assist, it involved uh, large industrial customers. It tried to pull together the main uh, or some of the most active, aggressive uh, players in the energy arena. Again, to try and do things in a better way. Those efforts were concentrated in large measure up, upon trying to internalize uh, what had been external costs, environmental costs that had not been built into uh, direct costs or into the pricing of that electricity. So when you ignore those very real, very significant costs, you have, uh, you have a misplaced uh, marketplace. And what has occurred in the ensuing 30 years or so is that we have uh, benefited in terms of the direct rates that we've paid because we're not facing those real costs, but now uh, it's coming home to roost. Those CO2 costs kind of encompass, because they're so massive, they encompass uh, all the other uh, environmental uh, effects of that coal mining and generation operation, including water use and other emissions and fly ash disposal and all of the things that uh, DEQ now is, is trying to address in terms of remediation. In the mid-90s, the political climate changed and the focus went away from this collaborative uh, working effort on trying to, uh, to have a more uh, rational energy, well, a more beneficial, in my view, energy future to one that was focused on restructuring and deregulation. We had the bankruptcies of both Montana Power and Northwestern Energy. Uh, we, we basically diverted attention from some of those passionate issues to other passionate issues that we could fight about. Uh, but long and short of it is, uh, we have now lagged uh, other states in terms of addressing uh, uh, compliance with what now is a, the final uh, clean power plan. This, I won't attest to the methodology or the uh, result that the un uh, Union of Concerned Scientists uh, came up with, but this is their assessment of the relative state progress of various uh, states in terms of, of actually achieving the goals uh, uh, to date. And of course, Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho uh, don't rank very well. Uh, Colorado, Utah, uh, Arizona kind of in the middle, and then we've got the front runners with California, Nevada, Oregon and, and Washington State that have actually uh, taken some fairly significant steps in trying to head this direction. 
So let's talk a little bit more about this transition uh, from uh, coal uh, to a, a different kind of future. Coal strip one and two, as I indicated earlier, are 40 years old. They were originally proposed, amortized, uh, the investment was made on the basis of 35 year life, uh, which was typical of coal plants that were uh, proposed from a financial standpoint. Whoop. They are by all accounts nearing the end of their useful life, particularly when CO2 costs and risks are recognized. The Washington Utility and Transportation Commission, which is the counterpart to the Montana PSC, has established a, a specific uh, investigation to determine the ongoing efficacy of those plants. And the direction has been, you better be very careful if you're gonna put additional dollars in those high risk uh, on the edge kind of plants. So that proceeding is, uh, is underway now. The markets have similarly already uh, uh, indicated that uh, coal strip one and two are uneconomic or right on the edge. Uh, there's a comprehensive study that, uh, that is part of that record in, in Washington that deals with that. So it may well be that uh, with or without Montana uh, involvement or direct action under the Clean Power Plan, uh, that those units uh, will be retired in some uh, a reasonable time frame, uh, reasonable transition. People have been concerned about reliability. What is this? What would the loss of big central station baseload uh, coal plants do to reliability in the western interconnection? And this is not confined to Montana. We've got uh, a huge complex in Wyoming. Uh, we have Colorado units. We've got New Mexico and Four Corner area. We've got Nevada, uh, Utah. All of those states have major coal plants that uh, will need to address these issues. Uh, so, uh, the hierarchy of reliability responsibility in the United States uh, rests first with FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, NERC, North American Electric Reliability uh, Corporation, WEC, and the Western Interconnection, and that's what we're part of, the big machine that runs the 14 or 15 states and a couple of uh, a uh, couple of Canadian provinces, BC and Alberta, and a little bit of, of uh, Mexico in the Baja region. So that is one big machine. Whatever is done in any part of the interconnection has the potential to impact others. So uh, WEC has a very important responsibility along with uh, the utilities that actually own and operate the transmission to assure that whatever is done uh, in this transition doesn't jeopardize the reliability of the grid. And probably the main indicator of that is the ability to function uh, within a frequency band under reliability standards that have been adopted and, and approved by FERC. So WEC is in the process of developing cases for the entire Western interconnection that look at the retirement, uh, an aggressive retirement schedule for these plants. And at the first instance, those are going to be production cost models uh, to examine uh, what the cost effect uh, will be of that kind of a transition. The second dimension of it is going to be the reliability aspect. If we replace uh, those big baseload coal facilities, uh, that are retired with renewables and demand side management, energy efficiency, does that jeopardize in some way uh, the reliability of the system and what mitigation actions, both electrically as well as resource wise, need to be taken uh, to assure that that does not occur. And there's a fail safe kind of an off ramp uh, it, 
on the uh, state and federal plan uh, if there are reliability uh, issues uh, presented as, as a result of the uh, transition. Additional renewables and transmission. We heard something about we heard uh, some about that uh, today. Uh, so as we sit today, there can be no real significant additional renewables development without transmission. Those transmission facilities are virtually loaded. They're constrained uh, in terms of being able to get firm. Uh, uh, capacity on those lines. So we had the MISTI project that was proposed to uh, to export uh, additional renewables. That uh, floundered for a number of reasons. Uh, but by and large, in the big picture of things, no significant additional renewables are going to uh, come onto the system without some transmission work. Thus far, the owners of that, that major transmission corridor, Path 8, have declined to upgrade those facilities, even though the uh, fix appears to be uh, primarily substation level work, not a new line, not new right of way, not new uh, 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 big changes, but rather uh, upgrade to uh, electrical facilities. That has not occurred. The retirements of Coal Strip 1 and 2, what I call the low-hanging fruit in terms of getting uh, a chunk of that emission reduction uh, for Montana, will free up some of that transmission capacity. Those units are uh, have a combined uh, capacity of just over 600 megawatts. We don't expect from a uh, reliability standpoint that there's going to be a one for one megawatt replacement renewable for, uh, for coal, but a significant uh, increase in transmission capacity is expected. The preliminary work that both Northern Tier Transmission Group, which is uh, Northwestern, Pacific Corps, and Idaho, have done preliminary tests on the retirement of those two units. Uh, those look pretty promising. There need to be additional dynamic studies, power flow studies, uh, to prove up whether or not the transfer capacity uh, will change on path eight, uh, and to what extent, and whether or not other electrical fixes uh, can compensate for whatever erosion there might uh, be. So. That study work and that reliability kind of analysis will occur and must occur under the Clean Power Plan and really should have occurred uh, earlier. So repurposing that uh, transmission is essential for Montana to grow the economy and to transition to renewables and energy efficiency. What about affordability? There was a very good presentation this morning, I thought, by uh, uh, Gary Gannon on the effects of the RPS standard on uh, utility rates in Montana, Northwestern uh, Energy specific. And they were pretty, pretty positive. I mean, with a 15% uh, renewable portfolio standard, uh, there's been virtually no change in terms of the rates. I'm, I'm confident that uh, given the declining cost of renewables and the ability to use existing transmission and of course pay for that transmission, uh, we have a very bright future in terms of economic development uh, to repurpose that transition to or transmission to renewables. What about impact on the communities? All of us are sensitive to that. All of us that have lived in uh, western states, and particularly Montana, understand in, uh, in uh, states that have uh, rely on natural resources that there are nasty cyclical and uh, economic changes, whether it's hard rock mining or 
timber or uh, wood processing. Uh, we've all had communities where uh, big layoffs occurred and uh, community impacts where the infrastructure and the local government base has been impacted by those uh, layoffs. Here we have a 15 year window, really, at the end game uh, to do things the right way, to learn and be sensitive to uh, worker impacts and retraining and redeployment of those uh, workers, to transition from the coal fields and the uh, coal plant uh, jobs to decommissioning, to uh, restoration and reclamation of 40 years of activity. Uh, very, very attractive long-term jobs with a real uh, generous transition plan in terms of time. There is no other industry other than the utility industry where that kind of a transition could be built in, designed in a prudent way uh, to take care of business and those communities. So really, I do see it as a real opportunity for that community and that area to uh, benefit uh, from, from this transition. It's important that we take advantage, we being the state of Montana in DEQ's uh, ultimate plan of the uh, early action uh, economic incentives. And they're focused on energy efficiency, uh, low income uh, communities. Uh, you know, Kathy Hadley and, and Jim and I have been working on those low income protection issues for uh, 40 years and are real sensitive to them. So I think, the Mon again, Montana really has an opportunity to do that in a good way and we hope we can help uh, in that, uh, that planning. And then at the bottom of, bottom or top, I think the bottom of this whole discussion is leadership. It's about the responsibility of leadership and the exercise of leadership. We are intimately connected with uh, the Northwest. There are five regional utilities in Washington and Oregon that own pro rata share of that transmission and, dis and uh, generation. Those, those political leaders and our states as, as uh, leaders need to work together, whether it is a market-based uh, <coughs> incentive program for uh, recognizing energy uh, carbon credits, or whether it is a commitment to a transition period, uh, a commitment by the Washington, Oregon uh, utilities to say, listen, we've relied on Montana for uh, 40, 30, 40 years. Uh, we need to mitigate those impacts, step up to the plate, and uh, buy uh, cost-effective Montana renewable resources, uh, or at least part of our portfolio that way, of course they want to build renewables in their own state. All of us understand that. But right here, in this instance, we have a, a situation where that big multi-state project, regional pros project, needs regional leadership uh, to take responsibility for it and to mitigate in a number of ways uh, that responsibility and, and impact. One of the key ways, I think, would be uh, to uh, be willing to and offer uh, competitive bids for these Montana resources on the transmission that is freed up through uh, retirement of coal plants. We'll have uh, our group will be putting up a website soon. I thought it was already up when I put this on. Um, we're going to have a lot of resource material and documentation in terms of research that you may want to do, uh, have a sense of what we've been looking at nationally uh, over the course of the last couple of months to, uh, for your own uh, 
uh, involvement. Again, I'm totally excited about Montana's future. I think this is a, a, an extraordinary opportunity for us in terms of widespread economic growth across Montana through energy efficiency and renewables. Uh, it's, uh, as the gentleman Gary Gannon said this morning, you looked at the chart of, of uh, uh, impacts on the uh, Rosebud County and the Wind Counties. Uh, that was quite impressive, both in terms of jobs and tax base and, and uh, diversity that it brought. So from my standpoint, that's all real positive and exciting. I'm happy to be here, uh, to be part of it, and uh, 